And thank you everybody for, um, for the opportunity uh, to present our work. So yes, this is this is joint work with Fong Zhou and Robert. Um, I fell in love with China when I went uh, in 2007 to Chengdu and started thinking about how I could uh, orient my research more in that direction. It turns out it was a really good idea because it's extremely important, it's even more so now than it was. And um, Fang Zhou had a passion for asset pricing research since he grew up in Shenzhen, uh, spent a lot of time on the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, and um, was wondering what made the prices turn red and green, and so found his way to NYU Stern, finance major, and he was acing classes with me and Robert and pounding on our door as a sophomore, begging to do uh, asset pricing research. And, um, and of course, Robert is a world-class asset pricing researcher, so um, it's, it's a good team. So, uh, so what we're looking at is, is, is the real value of China's stock market. We're thinking about the relationship between China's stock market and, and the macro economy at some level, but we're gonna bring to bear, we're gonna look at this through the lens of asset pricing research. So, um, there's a lot at stake here. China is the world's largest real investor, if you will, um, uh, by a wide margin. So almost five trillion of uh, investment in 2014, compared with three and a half trillion by the U.S. And um, it's also been the greatest contributor to global growth since 2007. So there's a quote in the Financial Times that uh, China produced more cement in two years than the U.S. had in its entire history. These guys are really the people planting the Lucas trees uh, in the world right now. And, um, and that's driven a lot of growth. So it's not just China's own uh, contribution to global growth, but, uh, almost a trillion last year uh, um, versus, let's say, 6.6 .6 trillion by the US. Um, and others are, are well, the UK is up 0.3 trillion. Also, China's economy's been driving growth uh, in, in many other countries as well. And um, so one of the big concerns is that this investment is increasingly inefficient. So we were just talking about huge excess capacity in the steel industry, um, bridges to nowhere, huge infrastructure projects which produce GDP in the, in, in the year in which they're built, but then they don't, they're not productive afterwards. So, um, and a lot of economists have, have measures of, of the inefficiency of this investment. And um, I think also the leadership understands that the old growth model isn't gonna work, it won't be sustainable if this in, if, uh, investment does not become more efficient. Um, so what's gonna determine the efficiency in the, of that investment? Well, to a great extent, China's financial system. And uh, it's a unique financial system. It's dominated by its banking sector, uh, which is the, the instrument of its centrally planned investment policy. And um, there's lots of, it, it, so it's a very relationship-driven, uh, reputation-based uh, financing channel, uh, which has done a lot in many people's uh, minds to fuel growth. But, the, but sort of that model is running out. And what, what we want to show is that though China's securities markets have, are still a sideshow to some extent, they're becoming increasingly important. And in fact, they're functioning very well. And they uh, provide a, a kind of a critical counterpart because of their role in, in creating trans aggregating information and creating transparency. They, they're a very important counterpart to this this amazing but but uh, very opaque banking sector. So um, I have a couple slides here, which uh, my research assistants helped helped me put together, um, to just kind of put put China's financial system and put stock markets, put markets and banks uh, into context. And I have to also say, um, Kim Schoenholz uh, was also very much part of helping helping me and helping us think about. Uh, about these systems here. Um, here's two financial systems, the US and China. They're in some sense both outliers. Uh, so the way the picture is drawn, I've kind of got the banking, the financial system in the middle, and then on the left-hand side is the assets of the financial system, and the right-hand side, you know, so these are the borrowers, and the right-hand side is, uh, is the liabilities of the financial system. So some sort of conceptual balance sheet of the financial system. And economists might draw the arrows going to the left because that's where capital is flowing, but finance people will draw the arrows to the right because that's where securities are flowing. 
And um, so the, they're each outliers. The US is a huge securities-based system, whereas China's is a huge bank-based system. And both of those are really rooted in the political economy and the culture of these two very different places. Um, uh, US financial system banks are, are, are still relatively small, though. Uh, they got a lot of attention during the crisis, and so that's a much hotter topic of research lately. But most of mainstream finance focuses on the U.S. financial system and, and focuses heavily on the securities markets. And it has this huge buy side to go with it to support those markets. So investors in the U.S. don't just buy individual stocks, they buy mutual funds. And so there's this, this whole spin cycle going on that takes the, the mortgages and home loans and everything revolving lines of credit, spin it through, slice it, dice it, send it out into mutual funds, and eventually it ends up in a, a household's money market account or a managed portfolio somewhere. In China, it works very differently. Um, households go to banks. Uh, they maybe uh, invest, um, they, uh, invest in administered deposits at administered interest rates of like 3%, or more recently, um, China has allowed this shadow banking sector to grow. And um, it's a little bit different than the way shadow banking works in the US. It's, it's essentially an add-on to the banking sector. Um, the, the, the traditional banking sector, this is characterized by uh, administered loans to state-owned enterprises primarily at administered interest rates. And then they're, they're taking money in from administered deposits. And, um, but post-crisis, uh, the government had this massive economic stimulus. And to implement that stimulus and get the capital out to farther, you know, to, to places that the traditional banking sector hadn't reached, it let this shadow banking sector essentially build on, add on, build out. And, um, but those, those shadow banks and trusts, long global government financing vehicles, are really working hand in hand with the banks. And um, so they've, since then, now there's not just traditional deposits, there's also wealth management products which are issue, which are like deposits only at higher interest rates. And they're not explicitly guaranteed, but there's been very little default. And uh, again, this is all very relationship-based, and the Chinese government really doesn't want any kind of a run on this banking system. So though they may have the right to default, you don't really see defaults there. So capital is allocated through this relationship-driven kind of administered channel, as opposed to being uh, allocated by, by markets in a very market-disciplined way. At the same time, there have been these, uh, so maybe I'll some of this stuff. Just some pictures that describe a little bit of what I, what I, uh, what I just said. Um, at the same time, so since Xi Jinping took power and has really, uh, people are saying he may be the most uh, powerful Chinese leader since Deng Xiaoping, but um, so uh, he's been talking a lot about reform and we had the third plenum in 2013 and fall 2013 and since then there's been this sort of steady rollout of financial reform. So Shanghai Free Trade Zone, not much has really happened with that yet, but lots of Banks have registered for accounts and are hoping for the uh, RMB convertibility and doing a little bit more. Um, they also opened up the uh, the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect program. So mostly China's financial market is in a bubble of its own, and capital is not allowed to go in and out between China and let's say the rest of what I would think of as kind of the globally integrated economy, which you could think of as represented by the U.S., but but it's it's really uh, globally. Um, but so there, there are QV programs, qualified foreign institutional investor uh, licenses that allow outsiders to do some investing inside of China. Um, but only a small amount of the quota has been taken up, and there's a lot of worry about repatriation risk and so on. Now there's this new Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect program, which is supposed to let uh, capital flow back and forth between the Shanghai Stock Exchange and the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. But that's still kind of in an incubation phase. And um, it may be that one of the reasons is people are really skittish about the Chinese stock market because it's had, it's had a really bad reputation. It's had a reputation as a casino. It's had a reputation for some really bad returns. And so we decided to take a look at this. 
And what we found was actually completely counter to all of those perceptions. That basically, China's stock market, though it is still a sideshow in the system dominated by a banking sector, has actually been functioning really well. And if you look at the returns that could be earned by a globally diversified investor, the returns have been quite high. And that's actually very consistent with some of the basic principles of, of international finance. So, so let me go through that. So China's stock market started in, uh, in 1992, just a few firms. Um, you can see the number of firms listed. Um, by 95, there were uh, over 500 firms. And um, more recently now, there's 2,500 firms listed. Um, there's still a very uh, slow IPO listing process, and that's very problematic. Uh, there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through, political favoritism. So um, uh, it's still hard for small and medium enterprises to get capital, to, to get listed. But this is definitely the key uh, enterprise financing channel, I think the way Tonto would put it. So, um, and Jenny, in fact, do you want questions? Yeah, sure, go for it. Do you have any data on? How much capital is actually raised, as a, let's say, as a share of investment by firms in the in the stock market? That would be a great question. Um, are you taking notes, John? Sure. Okay. I will. Yeah. Uh, so we haven't framed it that way. That's a really good question. So we we have we have actually four follow-on research projects. One of them is about intermediary asset pricing and the capital flows that come from that and. Um, so actually, our research assistant Kathleen is looking exactly at this. So, um, what are the different pieces of the of the financial system, and where are the capital flows going? So I can say a little bit about capital flows between the um, the banking sector and the stock market over the last year. But um, you're really putting your finger on, I think, a key question in here, which is you know, where's that capital going, and how much of investment is represented by stocks versus uh, the banking sector. I actually have a slide in here that I took out that said that addressed that. Uh, I mean, the, the number may be, even if the number is small, even if the number is yeah. small, on the margin it can be very important. So, but it's worth, it's worth sort of trying to put that in perspective. I, in um, fact, I had a slide and I took it out. Uh, I'm regretting it now. Uh, that the, right. that the, so, you know, they, they shut down the IPOs in 20, well, 13. They shut down the IPOs in 2013 altogether, so that just choked off. So since that time, there have not been IPOs? No, and then they reopened it in the beginning of Jan in January 2014. Okay. And so, uh, and the slide I had showed, yes, there have been some new uh, equity capital channel to um, firms through that IPO channel, but it's tiny compared with uh, new loans can we assume that IPOs are effectively net issuance, that there's no buybacks or some other replacement that's shrinking the, the float? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question, mm -hmm. right? Because right, is the IPO just these inside investors cashing out, or are they actually right. raising new capital for investment? Right. Um, that's not something uh, looked at, I don't know. I probably have some very rough figures just to share. So because the IPO was shut off for over a year, so the data was not comparable, uh, IPO restarted at the end of 2014. And the foreign-looking number is the following. So the market is looking to raise about 1.5 trillion um, um, Chinese yuan through the equity market, through IPO, and the secondary offer. Actually, second or third offer accounts for more than half of the equity fundraising because of this straight um, IPO registration I mean, approval process. Uh, on the other hand, incremental loans will be somewhere around 10 to 12 trillion. So it's like 1.5 trillion versus 10 trillion, 12 trillion. Kind of. These number are really more well off, but um, yeah, that's from the I think the problem is sort of like in China, if you issue equity, like there are many IPOs, you take it as like a negative news. So the Chinese SEC, SEC sort of limited number of stock that can go up each year. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, so that's so there's the, a long uh, literature in the economics and finance and accounting um, fields which link 
good legal and market institutions to the informativeness of stock prices about future profits and in turn to the efficiency of capital allocation and investment. And um, that's literature going back to Hayek and Fama and so on. And the, the role of the stock market is this idea that it can aggregate diffuse information about profits that's, that's spread across lots of different, broad class of investors. And, um, just be, and, so, and because they can trade, they have an incentive, in fact, to generate information. So they may go in, out and dig up stuff. And then um, that information works its way into prices. And uh, uh, um, so two things. One, it allocates capital the right way. And two, it can even create signals for managers. Uh, so for example, now that Jack Ma has uh, Alibaba trading, well, he, so he, maybe he's considering that mobile phone uh, acquisition or something. If uh, rumor gets around and the stock price goes down, he'll say, like, oh, okay, well, maybe the market doesn't like it. Maybe it's not a good idea. So he may know more about um, e-commerce than anyone, but there are still things he doesn't know and that may be aggregated into prices. And so this is kind of the way the underlying theory works about why market prices might be uh, really important for investment efficiency and that this is something that in some sense banks can't do. So banks may be very good at, at inside information and really custom tailored contracting and, um, and getting it different kinds of private information, but this idea of aggregating information and creating signals that everybody can use, this is something that you would look to markets to do, market prices. So um, we measure stock price informativeness uh, using, um, using a model, based on a model by our uh, colleagues um, Tama Philippon and Alexei Saboff and their co-author Jenny Bai. So they have a theory model which, which um, formalizes this intuition and the way they take it to the data, uh, they define price informativeness. So if you think about a point in time, they look at the, uh, the cross-section of firms and they, they essentially run a regression of the future earnings there's normalizations and so on here, but they're essentially running a regression of the future earnings on past market prices. And the idea is that the, that the prices are informative if the, if the firms that had higher prices were the ones, you know, after normalization are the ones that went on to have higher profits. And so the coefficient in that regression, and also the marginal R squared and predicted variation, there's three different ways of uh, slicing and dicing it, gives you a sense of the informativeness of prices, let's say in that month. And, um, with, and the prediction period could be uh, different amounts ahead. I think we're looking at one, two, and three years ahead. And so we look at uh, different forecasting periods and different measures of this informativeness, but let's just focus on uh, predicting two years out. So this is, uh, sorry, it's a little bit hard to read here just as well. Uh, <laughs> figure three on stock price informativeness. This shows the trend of that informativeness over time, from uh, 1996 to 2010. And um, what I, I should have actually blown this picture up, sorry. But so uh, actually what Fangjo has kind of dug up for us is kind of marking what was happening in the regulatory environment around this. So we kind of identify um, several different re regimes. So kind of in the beginning, uh, the market still just barely opening and um, uh, coming together, limit order books are unified, trading fees are reduced, um, some uh, stock indices are published, and so on. Um, in, in the late 90s, uh, this is a period of um, tremendous uh, accounting fraud and, and speculation, and you see stock price informativeness really plummeting there. So um, The units on that? from a, a y-axis are the coefficients from the regression? It's the predicted variation, so it's the coefficient times the standard deviation of the, of the covariate, which is the log of market value over, market value of equity over uh, Got it. assets. Okay. Um, so, uh, some scandals came to light that then triggered a whole bunch of investigations, a bunch of frauds, and also, um, uh, you know, there were also a great amount of not, of, of uh, portions of the 
market cap that weren't even traded. There was a lot of distrust of the markets, speculation, and so on. And this was a period when, when uh, price informativeness kind of uh, really uh, was bad. And this is, um, so around 2001 is when a famous uh, Chinese economist, Wu Jingliang, proposed the so-called casino theory of China's stock market, that prices weren't really linked to any fundamentals. It was just a big gambling casino. And, um, but then during this period, around, partly around reforms around the, the time that China joined the WTO and, and, and other reforms, um, uh, the CSRC started to kind of clean some things up. So it introduced um, stricter uh, de delisting regulation. It, um, it opened up the QFI program. A big turning point was that it began to unlock these non-tradable shares. So right, we're still in the process of privatization here. And um, so that unlock of shares really broadened the investor base. And, um, and other national nine rules uh, issued to strengthen minority shareholder protection and dividend policy and so on. So what we see then is that the stock price informativeness um, steadily increased. And the levels uh, of around points 0.03, 0.04, those are comparable to the levels of stock price informativeness that Bai, Philippon, and Sava find in the US data. So um, it, it, it looks like the market is, is, is starting to, to function and essentially getting, getting the numerator right, if you will. It's, it's, it's um, uh, explain, prices are explaining uh, profits in the cross section. Another thing that we look at is, um, the, the efficiency of corporate investment. So um, this is again another cross-sectional regression. We look at um, essentially the, the 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 equity values reaction to what we interpret as unexpected investment, and um, in the cross-section. And the idea is that a higher coefficient tells you that um, the market's got a more favorable reaction to unexpected investment. And that, um, so the interpretation is that corporate investment is more efficient. So again, we run that cross-sectional regression every month and look at the um, uh, correlation then in the time trend of uh, stock price informativeness and investment efficiency. And what we find is that the correlation is very high. So significant, uh, statistically significantly high, remarkably actually. So we're not claiming that this is a causal relationship, or that we have that we have shown any causality here. But um, and there are reasons, good reasons to think causality is going both ways, or there are other things that that would make both would both help prices to be informative and uh, investment uh, to be efficient. But I think that the level of correlation is sufficiently strikingly high that it would be useful for for regulators in China to pay attention to this, that um, mar these markets may be uh, playing a really important role and, and providing important signals to managers. So, so that's uh, looking, the price informativeness is kind of looking how well are prices doing at predicting profits, right? But the other thing that you want to think about in terms of whether the market looks reasonable and whether investors are pricing stocks in a way that we think makes sense is, is to say, well, are they discounting stocks in the right way? So, um, you know, how do Chinese investors price stocks? So remember, this is a segmented market. You're talking about Chinese investors pricing Chinese companies. At, and it's pretty much segmented from the, from the rest of the economy. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and start. By all means. You can catch up with Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't, don't worry about me. Um, so um, the way that, that uh, the mainstream asset pricing finance literature might look at this would be to say, well, let's look at different, let's look at stocks. Look, look at, you know, stocks have different characteristics. So one characteristic might be uh, their beta like how much covariance they have with the market. So that's a measure of risk. And people have looked at other things too. How big is the company? That might be a characteristic that people care, care about. 
what is the liquidity of the stock? Um, so things like this. Um, and what, what people have found in not just U.S. stock pricing, but also, you know, very broadly, globally, is that there's some clear patterns. So uh, in the U.S. and uh, in, in, in the global financial markets, investors require, uh, seem to require stocks to have a higher return if they have a higher beta. In other words, you have to be paid to hold a stock with a higher beta. Um, but uh, conversely, you will pay up for, for a, a stock, a bigger bigger company. Um, you will discount more for uh, illiquidity. And um, this max variable, this is, uh, this is Robert's invention. Um, it's, uh, it's the uh, maximum daily return in the previous month. If a stock has had a high max, it, you know, maybe it's uh, a behavioral thing or something, but people get excited about it. They, want, they think they're, they're going to win the lottery, so they, they tend to, to uh, pay up for stocks like that. And so what you then see is those stocks go on to have lower returns. So that's, that's kind of the, the, the pattern of the, of the way that global investors uh, seem to price stocks, and it's pretty well established. So we, we looked at the um, how Chinese investors price stocks, and we you know so again we look at what is the um, uh, excess return required or or forsaken for each of these different characteristics, and what we find is quite remarkable. The pattern is is very very similar to that in in U.S. stocks. Different people, different firms, but still Chinese investors. Uh, discount for market risk measured by beta. They pay up for large stocks. Uh, they discount for uh, illiquid stocks. They pay up for what they perceive to be long shots and so on. So um, rational or irrational is pretty consistent with the way equities are priced the world around. Um, so that's another, I, I, I take that as another vote for sort of, I don't know, the rationality of the market in any case. It's some evidence on that. Um, let's see if I want to, what I want to say about that. Um, in the U.S., people have they think about um, about there being sort of risk factors in the equity market. So the the overall market is a risk factor, and then. There are, other, there are other risk factors that have been constructed. Um, uh, a so-called size factor, uh, um, a value factor, uh, momentum factor. So these are essentially, they're like hedge funds that people have constructed that they think are, are offer a particular required return and then the, the, the required return on an on a arbitrary security or portfolio would just just be described by whatever its exposure is to those factors, and so you get a, you get a kind of a pricing model. So we we took that idea to the Chinese market, and we constructed those same uh, levered market um, small minus big stocks. That's one kind of uh, hedge fund. Um, uh, value stocks minus growth stocks, all constructed from the Chinese data, and use those as our um, kind of. Uh, risk factor mimicking portfolios. And so that we can then assess uh, uh, how those, how those uh, portfolios are doing. And, um, and then you can go ahead and uh, look at how, um, at, look at the alphas of the stocks with respect to those portfolios, of, of uh, Portfolios sorted on various characteristics, such as the liquidity or this maximum, and um, what we find is again the first of all, uh, more illiquid portfolios have higher returns, um, high max portfolios have lower returns, and the patterns are again very s consistent with what you find in the U.S. data. So next we look at the at the overall um, at the overall performance of China's stock market, and we compare it to the to the overall performance of markets in, in three other large economies: um, the U.S., Europe. We're putting Europe all together, and Japan. And um, so, one thing we find: so over the period 1995 to 2012, 
China had a really high uh, average monthly return. So the US dollar returns, 15% um, on an annualized basis in excess of the risk-free rate, compared with like 7% in the US, 7% in Europe, and like minus 2% in Japan. But that's also coming um, with a very high volatility, which Chinese investors can tell you they, they feel the pain of that. So, um, okay, so what does that mean? Well, so that's just broadly looking, China has a very high uh, average return, but also very high volatility. Now, how about, how does it correlate with the other markets? Um, so the next slide looks at the, it, we're looking also at these other factor portfolios, which I guess is why I mentioned them, but let's just focusing on RMRF. That is the, um, the market return in excess of the risk-free rate. We look at how that, how that excess return um, uh, correlates across countries. And so what you find is the US, Europe, and Japan, they're very highly correlated with each other. US and Europe, 83%. Their, their stock markets are 83% correlated, very high. Um, also, uh, Europe and Japan are around 50%. But if you look at China, its correlation with these other stock markets is very low. Right? This is really a segmented market. Um, so what does that low correlation mean? Well, from an investment perspective, if that means it's a terrific diversification instrument, uh, if you're a global investor uh, looking for additional uh, investment opportunities. And so a way of formalizing that idea is to calculate the alpha, let's say, the possibly hypothetical alpha on China's market portfolio. So if you can get a QT license or invest through the uh, Shanghai Hong Kong Connect and buy China's market portfolio, um, how well do you do? Well, the way we think about it, we need to adjust for any risk exposure that we think that, let's say, US or global investors would charge for. So that's the idea of um, adjusting for any beta that it has. Well, China's correlation is so low that it's got virtually zero beta with respect to the US market. So all the excess return is, is almost all of that is alpha. And you're getting like 100 basis, basis points a month of alpha. And so one thought is, well, that's a, that's a rich investment opportunity for global investors if they could access it. And, um, but the flip side is it's also very high cost of capital for China's firms. And there's an implication that if you could open up capital uh, flows between the two economies, you could have money flowing into China uh, and um, push prices up, bring um, the cost of capital down, and fuel investment. Um, you could look at it the other way. You could look at it from the perspective of a Chinese investor who has to buy and hold China's uh, portfolio. So then they're not looking at alpha. They have to look at their buy and hold return if they cannot globally diversify. Then they get killed by variance. And so buy and hold returns. So when I, I presented this uh, uh, many places in, in China, they're like, no, the stock market's been terrible. Uh, it's like, well, yeah, if you have to buy and hold it, right, up 100%, uh, down 50%, you're back to even if you're a buy and hold investor. But if you're a diversified investor, and that's just a piece of a dynamically rebalanced portfolio, that's an average return of 25% uh, each period. So, um, so, it re so that's really highlighting that not only are those capital barriers uh, keeping global money out and from, from um, investing in you know, Chinese lucas trees, it's also constraining Chinese investors who would benefit from global diversification. Um, so we just have a, kind of a couple editorial comments about some of the recent stock market moves um, just viewing through the lens of this research. So one is, China had a really, China stock market had a really bad uh, stretch of years post-crisis. And our interpretation is that that was actually quite a, a rational downward price response to the fact that the, the shadow banking sector was exploding, issuing all these wealth management products. Um, so before, investors had maybe 3% deposits to compete with the stock market. Now, there's 5% or 7% returns on wealth management products that look like deposits, and they're more or less implicitly guaranteed. So that's just an upward shock to the discount rate. 
And um, so then stock prices are going to have to come down to offer required offer returns that are competitive with, it, with that. And, um, and there's some evidence consistent with that in the pattern of uh, the A share, H share discount, where A shares are, are, are Chinese firms priced by global investors who did not experience the same discount rate shock. Um, we're, we're, this is, this is, we're going to look more at that in a, in a follow-on paper. But there's some consistent we can see with that story. Then finally, most recently, um, I don't know how many of you are invested in the Chinese stock market, but if you've been following it, um, it was up almost 50% last year. And most of that was right around the end of November, beginning of December, a huge jump there. And our interpretation is that the stock market really loves this announcement of deposit insurance. Because in China, uh, deposit insurance is kind of the first step towards a, a reform of the banking sector, which, which would tighten the, the, the boundary around the guaranteed sector and start to then open the door to letting things that are outside that boundary default or sink or swim on their own. And um, so then that starts to mean, first of all, there's much less risk-free stuff and um, uh, more market discipline lending decisions may start to go on. And um, uh, so this now means then the stock market has less to compete with in terms of required returns and uh, doesn't have to compete with the entire shadow banking sector, maybe just compete with the, reducing the subsidy to the banking sector. And there is definitely uh, evidence that A-share account registration has gone way up, money's flowing back into the stock market. And um, basically, yeah, as you rein in the subsidy to the shadow banking sector, it gives the chance for the market to thrive a little bit. So just to sum up, um, contrary to casino theory, we find that stock prices in China are as informative about future profit as they are in the US. And the trend of stock price informativeness is highly correlated with the trend of investment efficiency, which we think is a uh, is a, it's an important result. Um, though it's a segmented market, uh, investors in China seem to be pricing stocks very consistently with the way they're, in, they're priced uh, in the integrated global financial markets. Um, uh, the market's actually performed quite well from the point of view of a diversified global investor. Um, but uh, continued reforms need to clean up the, the the IPO process and, and, and streamline that channel. And then eventually, right, so clean up its banking sector uh, and rein that in, uh, develop the markets a little bit more, then eventually move towards convertibility of the yuan and liberalization of the yuan and open up the markets, uh, open up uh, capital flows between China and, and, um, and global investors. Um, and give that market a chance to attract capital and, and allocate it uh, more efficiently. And we also think that um, that China's stock market is a kind of a crystal ball on what's going on, right? So it's reacting to these reforms. As reforms come out, right, it, uh, you, even in the cross-section you can see, well, oh, okay, if, if manufacturing stocks are up and uh, infrastructure stocks are down, then maybe your consumption-driven policy is working, or maybe not. So that's a direction for future research, which is to think about if there are kind of economic reform factor-mimicking portfolio and, and what you could learn from, from tracking that. But it's, a, it's an important um, counterpart to, to China. China will, will, will develop the financial system its own way, but it doesn't mean that stock markets don't have an important role. Okay, thank you very much.